It's Tuesday, October 31st, 1995, and this is Dateline NBC Tonight. More than a million pounds of steel bearing down on a school bus full of teenagers. The train kept going, people started panicking, not knowing what to do. They were just yelling, um, there's a train coming, get off the tracks. An instant of terror that devastated one small town. How could it happen? Bob McEwen talks to those who witnessed the deadly collision and those who lived through it. A couple of kids, they were kind of slumped over the seats and there were kids just lying in the aisles and there's moans and screams. It's a Dateline survivor story. From Studio 3B in New York, here is Jane Pauley. Good evening. You're running late, so you take a different route to work or take the bus instead of the car. Or maybe it's construction on the highway or the weather. A thousand and one ways your daily routine can be altered. Last Wednesday in Illinois, that's what happened. A school bus was running late. Simple as that. Now a small town is grieving for seven teenagers killed when a commuter train smashed into that bus. Bob McEwen reconstructs the haunting set of circumstances that for some meant the difference between life and death. It's a Dateline survivor story. Fifty miles northwest of Chicago, at the station in Crystal Lake, Illinois, the day began much like any other with a train just like this. Nothing to hint that in a matter of minutes, friends and strangers would be thrown together in a fateful moment where everyday decisions would become matters of life and death that would change one small town forever. Last Wednesday, 6.50 a.m., train number 624 began boarding commuters for the 84-minute run to the Windy City. Not long before, the buses for School District 155 were beginning their morning run. But already, something was wrong. Bus 103, much the same as this one, bound for Cary Grove High School, was without its regular driver, who hadn't come to work that day. Instead, Patricia Kattenkamp, a 54-year-old safety supervisor, would drive the bus that day. She often filled in behind the wheel. Camp had a spotless record, but she'd never driven this particular route before. What's more, when she finally rolled out of the depot, she was already 20 minutes behind schedule. Freshman Zach Davis and Katie Krebeck were waiting at the first stop. We were just, you know, standing around, and then it got to be quarter till, and people started going home because it's too late. And finally, the bus came at 6.55. Like the rest of the kids on the bus, Zach and Katie had their favorite seats. But on Wednesday, they offered to sit up front and help guide Cattencamp along the route. I got on and she started right in with, I need somebody to help me out the route. I don't know it. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. She had no clue to go straight or whatever, you know. It's like she was totally confused. Train 624 pulled out of Crystal Lake at 7 a.m., right on time. They call it the flyer, because when it leaves here, it flies through the next two towns down the line without stopping. Still running far behind, the bus crossed over the tracks for the first of two times. Minutes later, it picked up sophomore Lane Gillis. It was chilly. That's kind of what made the wait longer, is that we were kind of cold waiting for uh, the bus. We were just kind of holding arms tight like this and trying to keep warm until the bus showed up. Jeff Clark took the bus, though he had just got his driver's license. His buddy, Joe Calte, had car trouble. Their friend, Tiffany Schneider, had just got her first paycheck from her first job. By 7.05, traffic was backing up in Fox River Grove, and Helen Getchell was in the middle of it. As a hospice nurse, she cares for the dying. She didn't know it then, but that's an irony that would soon become painfully apparent. It had been a while since Helen stopped at the White Hen Pantry opposite the Algonquin Road railway crossing. I said, well, I don't have to see the patient yet. Might as well get some coffee, and I very rarely come and get coffee. 7.09 that morning, the flyer sped past neighboring towns, 1.2 million pounds of steel barreling down the tracks at 60 miles per hour, below the maximum allowable speed. A minute later, the last of 39 kids got on at the final bus stop. But as luck would have it, three regulars, all freshmen, had other plans. 
Michelle Coons had a dentist appointment. Christy Mitz got a ride to school. Natalie was driven by her dad. If she would have had to leave five minutes earlier, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have been able to be at school that early. So I would have had to take in the bus. The closer the bus got to the crossing, the more important little things became. Ninth grader John Anfinson sat in the third row after a sophomore named Joe Calte had pointed out a fact of life for freshmen. He said that uh, the back was for uh, upperclassmen, so I just kind of moved up. If he hadn't told me that day to uh, sit towards the front, I probably would have sat in the back that day. Where kids were seated would become the single most important factor for survival in the moments to come. 7:10, a mile from the crossing. The flyer was a blur as it sailed down the straightaway towards Fox River Grove, right on schedule. At almost the same time, the driver steered the bus onto Algonquin Road and headed towards the tracks. I remember warning her that there was tracks ahead. We uh, pulled up the tracks and she slowed down and stopped. Pat Cattenkamp looked and listened, but would later say she neither saw nor heard a train as she crossed the tracks and stopped immediately at a red light. Just then, builder Jim Hummela pulled up to the crossing behind the bus on the other side of the tracks. That's when he saw the train. I knew it was going to hit the bus because when I looked, it, to me, it looked like the bus was two to three feet into the tracks. And Hummela was right. At that crossing, the distance between the tracks and the stop line is only 30 feet. The bus was 38 feet long. It was almost 11 minutes past 7 a.m. at 60 miles an hour. The engineer had to begin braking right about here, three quarters of a mile from the Algonquin crossing to avoid a collision. But that didn't happen as the flyer hurtled past the point of no return. Train 624 was where it was supposed to be doing what it was supposed to be doing. Chris Napton with Chicago's Metro Railroad says there are only three things an engineer can do. You cut the throttle, put the train in emergency, blow the horn. Actually, there's four. You can pray, and he did. Just over half a mile from the crossing, the flyer tripped an automatic signal that triggers lights and bells, warning vehicles to clear the tracks. The gates came down, striking the bus. I could hear a whistle very, very far away. It was just a little past the depot, I saw it. And that's when I said, it's the flyer coming through. That's when the kids in the back of the bus started to scream. There's a train coming, there's a train coming. Move, move. I turned around, I could see the train it was, as it kept getting closer. And I just kept thinking to myself, oh my god. When I looked out the window and saw the gate go off and start to come down, that's when I got up and ran. Amy? and myself started screaming for the bus, go, go, go. Kids started to um, crawl over seats and go down the aisles and just try and get out of the way. As I ran, I was telling people to run and saying, I'm gonna run, let's everybody run off the bus. But at the very front of the bus, no one seemed to hear the train's whistle or the screams from behind. I didn't hear any direction from anybody back there. It was now 11 minutes past seven o'clock. I remember hearing wind breeze through as the impact occurred. Cold air just rush in, and my feet left the ground. The force of the impact sheared the body of the bus off its chassis and spun it 180 degrees. It landed upright next to the crossing. And then I remember opening my eyes, and I was lying on one seat, and someone was sitting on one of my legs, my left leg. Nurse Helen Getchell was one of the first on the scene. She went to the aid of Jeff Clark, one of the most critically injured students. He had just got his first driver's license. I yelled out. I said, I'm losing him. Can you please get a suction? Uh, somebody ran across the street. I don't know who got me a um, turkey baster, so I suctioned him off, and he died in my arms. Jeff Clark's friend, Tiffany Schneider, died too. She never got to cash her first paycheck. Five others were also killed, most seated at the back, all linked together in life and death. Among them was sophomore Joe Calte, who had car trouble. It was Joe who told freshman John Anfinson he wasn't old enough to sit at the back of the bus. 
John escaped with only minor injuries. I'm, I'm lucky in a way that he told me to sit towards the front. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm glad that he did because he, I guess he could, I guess you could say he saved my life. Tomorrow, the school bus will again wend its way through Fox River Grove. The flyer will make its daily commuter runs to Chicago. Both will pass an impromptu memorial to those who died on one fateful day in October. By the way, the substitute driver, Patricia Kattenkamp, who was at the wheel that day, is cooperating with investigators. And according to today's Chicago Sun-Times, repairmen checked the traffic light five weeks before the crash, detected a possible problem, and recommended that work be done on the timing system. But that work was never done.